Hey everybody, it's Mr. Wagstaff. Cool stuff to talk about today. So we're going to start a new unit, all right? A lot of stuff being covered in this unit. We got some imperialism. We got an entire war that we fight with Spain called the Spanish-American War. Uh, the progressive era hits a whole new level. Uh, we get a, a president in named Theodore Roosevelt. How he becomes president is crazy. It's kind of the downfall in this unit of the robber barons and basically sets us up uh, by the end of the unit of America being a world power. Now, a lot of stuff to get done in this unit, a lot of cool stuff to talk about, and a lot of cool stories uh, that we're going to get into. So I want to go ahead and show you here at the start. This is kind of my cover photo for, for the unit. Uh, this guy right here, one of the more famous presidents uh, that we're going to have, he really changes the trajectory of where America is going. This is a guy named Theodore Roosevelt. Super cool, borderline unbelievable stories uh, that involve Theodore Roosevelt. Fantastic guy to talk about. Uh, fascinating, I should say, uh, guy to, to talk about. So we're going to get into him, but today, today we have to talk about the West the middle of the country uh, and what is happening in the middle of the country. Now, we have mentioned this uh, in previous units, um, so none of this is going to be a huge surprise. So the West uh, has become very populated. They're farmers. The Homestead Act allowed people to move out there. There's a handful of things that get developed at the time that make life functioning, functional in the middle of the country. All right. And some of these we, we've talked about the windmill. This is a huge invention that happens in the middle of the country uh, because even though the windmill isn't new, it is used to pump water out of the ground so you can have consistent irrigation. Uh, the steel plow created by John Deere, absolutely necessary to uh, till up the, the rough land in the middle of the country. So the steel plow it's like a family heir heirloom that could be passed from generation to generation. Uh, things like the McCormick Reaper are extremely important in American history at this time because the entire center of the country, all right, is filled with farmers. They're not rich, all right. They were given this land. They had to still had to take loans out that we're going to get ready to talk about today in order to build the farms that they're providing the entire country with food. Stuff like the McCormick Reaper, these huge machines that usually either towns would go in together or groups of farmers would because they're really expensive and very few farmers could afford to have their own. But the McCormick Reaper harvest crops very quickly because of these big machines. The reason that's important is a lot of times you were uh, kind of limited by how much food you could grow by how much you could harvest because if you don't get the food out at a certain time, it can all rot. So doing it by hand, there's only so much you can do before you run out of daylight day after day after day until all the crops that you didn't get out of your fields die. Stuff like the McCormick Reaper, these big machines that harvest stuff, they make life a lot easier for the uh, farmers in the middle of the country because you can harvest as much food as you grow. You don't have to worry about it rotting in the field before you can get it out. Because keep in mind, the only labor you have is how many kids you got. Because there's no more slavery, there's no more forced labor. So the people in the middle of the country, it's usually just large families living on these farms. And there's tons of farms and they're growing a lot of food. Now, you would think it would be hard, because it, it, it is, is why you should think this, to convince people to move out in the middle of nowhere, away from civilization, um, and go fight in the wilderness. This is in the 1800s. This isn't the 1700s where, you know, everybody's coming over here or the 1600s, 1500s. You got pilgrims and, you know, this whole manifest destiny mentality. People like society. So to convince a whole bunch of people they can pack up and move out in the middle of nowhere away from society, that's a tough sell. So one of the things that really helps uh, socially, I guess, psychologically, to get people to move out in the middle of the country is stuff like this. So there's a company called Sears, which is, it's been going out of business for like forever now. It's, I think it's, I think it's completely done now, which is kind of sad because I always used to be able to reference it. People knew that what Sears was, the, the store. So here recently they've, they've gone out of business, but they've been around for a really long time. It used to be called Sears and Roebuck, but they're famous because they had a catalog. Just like today, you can order stuff on the internet, like Amazon. You can go to Amazon, type it in what you want, and pay for it and they'll send it to you, all right? 
In the 1800s, this is what this ma uh, magazine was. This was a list of everything that Sears sells from their stores, right? And you can go through this catalog, see what you want, send them money, and they will mail you whatever you want. And you could have any, you could buy plows here, you could buy grass seed here, you could buy alcohol here, you could buy, you could buy like pretty, pretty much anything that you could imagine, you can buy from this catalog. So the Sears mail order catalog is what this is called, or, or just mail order catalogs in general. Sears wasn't the only store that did this. It allowed people to move out to the middle of the country and have the same lifestyle as if they were living in a city. So it makes it really, 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 uh, 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 not real smooth. It makes it smoother to move to the middle of the country because you're not abandoning civilization because you can still have all the same stuff that people have in the cities regardless of where you live at. So the mail order catalog really did help make it easier for people to accept moving out in the middle of nowhere. But, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. All these people went out here on the Homestead Act, large families, they're all growing food. Um, there starts to be some issues because the farmers are out in the middle of the country and they kind of get forgotten about. And in the late 1800s, in the 1890s, they're going to bow up and say, you ain't going to forget about us because we're a powerful force to be reckoned with. Because there is a thing called the populist movement that happens in the late 1890s where the farmers in America get mad. And they, they get very mad at a very complex situation, right? So it's on this idea of trying to base money on the gold standard. Now, this is the single most, I'll make myself bigger here so, 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 I, so I can, uh, this is the single most complicated concept in American history, all right? It is extremely complicated. So I'm not going to try to race through this. I'm going to explain it to you. I fully expect that you are going to understand this very complex idea of inflation and deflation, basing money on the gold standard and, and, and all that uh, here shortly. But before we get started, get loosened up. All right, because you got some thinking to do. You got to follow me here and put on your thinking caps. Put on your thinking caps. No, I, I, all right. Yeah, I know you're not putting on your thinking caps. I can see you. All right, and I'm a little disappointed in that. You know what? I guess I'll just put on my thinking cap. All right, because when you get ready to talk about something tough, you got to have your thinking caps on, all right? I'm really hoping y'all don't actually not have a thinking cap. That's like, this is like a real thing. It helps you think. So this is my thinking cap. So I got it on so I can teach you the most effective way possible. All right, let me teach you about some inflation and deflation. All right, man, I feel smarter already. Put myself up here in the corner. All right, so all this stuff here is, is in your notes, but I'm gonna go and try to sh tell it to you story-wise. All right, this is a guy, or I'm calling him Bob, all right? So let me tell you a story about fictional Bob here, all right, and how life and money works in present day society using a fictional character, Bob. This is Bob, all right? So Bob, just a guy, just a normal guy, nothing, there's no backstory to Bob, Bob, just like poof, Bob exists, whatever, there's Bob. Bob, all right, just, just go with me on this. Bob, in the year 2020, right, decides to buy a house. So he buys a house and he pays $100,000 for it, all right? He pays $100,000 uh, for this house. Now, Bob doesn't actually have any money. So how can Bob buy a house if he doesn't have any money? Well, what Bob does is he borrows the money from a bank. He goes to the bank and says, hey, bank, can I have some money? The bank's going to say, sure, Bob, here you go. And the bank is going to give Bob money. Now, the bank doesn't give Bob money because they're just being nice. Bob's going to have to pay that money back plus interest, all right? And so interest uh, is like thank you money 
for loaning me the money. So not only is Bob had to pay back the hundred thousand dollars, he'll end up paying back a whole lot more than that. Here's a little, little thing that, that, that you may have heard in previous courses, but I, I think it's worth noting. If Bob gets a $100,000 loan over 30 years at 4% interest, this is where my thinking cap comes in, all right? Bob, 4% of $100,000 is $4,000. So how much does Bob have to pay back? Where you're like, well, he owes $100,000 plus the $4,000 he owes $104,000 back to the bank. No, 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 no. That $4,000 is how much he has to pay as thank you money every year until he pays off that $100,000 over the course of 30 years. So $4,000 times 30 is $120,000. That's how much money Bob will pay in thank you money in addition to the $100,000 he borrowed. Bob will pay back $220,000 on a $100,000 loan. That, that is why the banks are more than happy to give people money because you have to pay it back. This is how America works, all right? That, that, that's, not, that's not something shady in the 1800s. That's how loans work present day. This is why banks give, give out money is because they make a lot of money by loaning people money. All right, so I'm getting a little off, uh, off base here. Here's what you have to understand about Bob's loan. This is really important and this is how loans work. So it's a 30 year fixed mortgage. All that means is no matter what happens, his debt doesn't change, it doesn't increase, decrease. It, it just, and he's just methodically paying it off every month and after 30 years, He's paid off his loan. He will officially own the house because the bank owns the house until Bob pays it off. He gets to live there, but they technically own it. All right. So the way it breaks down to all math calculations, click, 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 click. He has to pay $800 a month in his mortgage. Like it's like mortgage is like rent, but you own it. So you're paying off a debt. So it's called your mortgage. So Bob pays, we're, we're, I'm just making this up, $800 a month is how much Bob has to pay every month for 30 years. Now, if you're going to go try to do all the math, and be like, well, does that add up? There's taxes and other stuff. So it's, it's, it's variables. That's more of an economics discussion. All right. So Bob pays $800 a month every month for 30 years. So in 12 years and three months from here, so in the year I don't know, 2032, how much will he pay every month? $800. It never changes. So for 30 years, he pays $800 every month. He has to uh, make that payment or uh, the bank's going to come take the house back. You're with me so far. Good. All right. So what this means, though, though he lives in this house, he doesn't actually own it. Bob is $100,000 in debt. That's... That's kind of how society works. People take out loans. People don't have, very few people have $100,000 up front to go buy a house with, all right? So Bob had to borrow it. So this puts Bob in debt. Most Americans, like 90 plus percent of Americans are in debt where they are paying off loans of some sort. Typically house and car are the two most common uh, uh, loans that people have. Also student loans, which is a whole different, I don't even want to go into that category. Ignore I said that because that's a whole different thing. But uh, houses and cars are the most common form of debt, uh, of things that you own in America. All right. So Bob's hundred thousand dollars in debt. Most Americans are in debt. Now you're like, okay, cool. I'm, I'm cool. I, I know what Bob says. So we're gonna come back to Bob in a second here, but I wanted to give you that precursor to Bob before I start talking about what is really important here. This concept of inflation and deflation. All right. So here, here's kind of the first rule to this whole concept we're going to talk about that don't ask me why this is like this. It just is. Money every year is either going to increase in value or decrease in value. The paper dollar bills that you have, it either increases every year or decreases. 
Money can never remain the exact same value year in and year out. Why is that, Mr. Wagstaff? I don't know. I, I, I need more lights, I guess. I, 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 that's super complex of why money has to change value. It just does. It does naturally, all right? So when the value of, of the dollar, all right, if, if it's stronger or weaker each year, it varies. There's two different terms for that. It's inflation or deflation, whether or not the value of the dollar goes up or the value of the, do of the dollar goes down. Now, for those of you that really like details, I got a really good graph right here, all right? If you wanna pause me right now and look at this graph, this is a really, really good graph. If I try to go over this graph, uh, about half of the people are gonna stop watching me right now, so I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna go back to Bob and try to explain inflation and deflation using Bob. But if you like details and accurate stuff and not Mr. Wagstaff and his thinking cap, pause me right now and, and read this uh, and understand this and, and you're golden. But this is pretty complicated, so I'm going to step you through. We're going to go back to Bob here in a second. So inflation, and we're going to go back to Bob here, but I want to give you some ideas on inflation and deflation. Inflation means the value of the dollar goes down. All right, and you actually lost value of the dollar. So inflation, even though it sounds it means going up, it means the value of the dollar goes down. The reason it's inflation is you need more dollar bills to buy the same thing. All right, so money has to be based on something. We were at one point based on gold. Instead of people just carrying around gold, we had money that represented gold, so you could just pay use the money, and then you could take that money to the bank and they would exchange it for the equal amounts of gold all right uh that is so money was representative at gold at one point all right so if you just printed more money say uh well you don't have more gold so if you print more money you don't actually have more value you just have more dollar bills but the same amount of gold that the money represents so every time you print more money, it actually makes the money worth less because it takes more dollars to equal the same amount of value. If that's like above your head, let me give you a, a simpler example here. Uh, in 1970, a cup of coffee cost 25 cents. 2019 cost $1.59, the exact same cup of coffee. Why did the prices increase? Because money has started to be worth less over time. That's called inflation, all right? So the value of the dollar has gone down. Now, here's what also has happened. Uh, in 1970, uh, your minimum wage was probably like $1.25. In 2019, I think the minimum wage is $7, all right? So uh, while the prices increase, people get paid more. So the person who could afford this in 1970, the equivalent person can afford it the same way in 2019. So while prices go up, <clears throat> so does paychecks, right? Now, deflation is the opposite. It would be that money, all right, it becomes worth more and a price of everything plummets. So like if deflation was happening where the value of the dollar goes up and the prices uh, go down, because it takes less money to buy something, all right? Uh, this, if this was 25 cents, this would probably be like a nickel, right? And the prices would go down. Now, this is, we're, we're slowly getting there, we're getting ready to go back to Bob, and I'm gonna uh, explain deflation more in, in, in detail here. Deflation is really bad for America. If money is worth more, it is devastating to America. And I'm gonna explain to you why. So I do have a little cartoon here, kind of threw it in here uh, in case it clarifies. Uh, this is supposed to be representing inflation. This is a, uh, uh, somebody, he's tearing money in half. He's giving him half and, and he's gonna keep half. He's like, hey, we both have money, but it, it's not actually, you haven't increased the value. You just doubled, like you have two pieces of money now. It doesn't actually mean it can buy double. It's a, real, it's, it's a different way of looking at inflation. All right, so. Let's get back to Bob here, all right? Let, 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 let me get back to Bob, and let's talk about some of Bob's finances. Now, you guys stay with me because this is, ends up being a very important story in, in, in U.S. history. All right, so Bob 
Bob will say Bob makes two thousand dollars per month at his job. All right, he makes two thousand dollars per month. All right, so if inflation, how keep in mind he owes eight hundred dollars a month for his mortgage, so he has to pay eight hundred a month. All right, if inflation happens, all right, which means the price of everything goes up. Bob will actually start getting paid more money. Now, I mean, if gas is $7 a gallon, like, oh no, but then Bob makes a lot more money, they even out. You can buy the same amount of stuff. That's called your cost of living increase. If prices go up, you get paid a little bit more. So we'll say inflation has been happening where the prices of everything keep going up. So Bob gets paid a little bit more to keep up with that. Bob makes $2,700 a month. Well, here's where it's important, all right? His monthly payments on his debt are still $800. He's been locked into that debt. So even though he makes more money now, he still has to pay $800 a month in debt. So it's actually beneficial for him, somebody that's in debt, to have inflation happen because that amount of money is locked in of what you borrowed. That's what you have to pay back. That doesn't change. So when inflation happens, and yes, prices are going up, but people start getting paid more, it's easier to pay off your debt. So inflation is good for poor people and people that are in debt, all right? Because when you get more money, it's easier to pay off your debt. Are you with me? Good. Because let's talk about what happens. Uh, th this one here says, how deflation affects Bob. We'll start out, Bob makes $2,000 a month. You can already see that Bob, Bob, is, Bob is upset, all right? He was happy. Oh yeah, Bob's already getting irritated here. So if deflation happens, the price of everything goes down, all right? Uh, Bob will gradually start getting paid less because of the cost of living decreases. Like, hey, gas is a nickel, great. A new iPhone, brand new, the iPhone 42 or whatever it'll be. 75 bucks. Instead of being over $1,000, it's 75 bucks. Hooray! However, Bob, instead of making $2,000 a month, now only makes $700 a month for his job because everything's so cheap. How much is his debt? His monthly payments on his debt are still $800 a month. That does not change. Yet he only makes $700 a month. Uh-oh. That's not good for Bob who's in debt. Bob, oh, he's real upset now. Bob, the bank takes Bob's house, all right? Uh, and that's called a foreclosure because he stopped making payments. They take his house and Bob loses everything because of deflation and Bob is uh, uh, completely devastated here. Here's poor Bob, all right? Bob's a homeless person now, all right? Uh, so how does deflation affect the rich? Because in that situation, you're like, man, everybody should hate deflation. Mm, no, they do not. You know why they don't uh, dislike deflation? Because if you're rich and you just have a bunch of money already, when deflation happens, your existing money becomes worth more. You don't have to pay off debt because you're rich. You already own everything. So rich people can just sit here and hold their money and it just becomes worth more and more and more. And rich people love deflation, but it is absolutely astronomically, catastrophically, negatively impactive on poor working Americans, people like Bob here, who is now a homeless person, all right? Because he can't pay his debts. When deflation happens and the value of the dollar goes up, you can't pay your debts, all right? So this is a, a rich banker guy who's super happy, loves this, all right? But it destroys most of America. Now, the majority of America is poor. Still is today. Uh, I shouldn't say poor, in, in, in debt of some sort. All right, the vast majority are. In the 1800s, it was even more than that. Guess who got to make all the laws? The rich people. The rich people made the laws. The rich people are the ones who, who made the laws. Uh, because they, all right, uh, the rich people are the ones that, that make the laws because they control Congress with the robber barons and these rich guys. They absolutely like deflation. All right. 
So if you have a decent understanding of inflation and deflation and which one is good for who, all right, then we can move on and talk about this story. And the story is pretty straightforward if you understand inflation and deflation. All right. After the Civil War, now nah, let me back up. Civil War uh, cost a bunch of money. You need millions and millions and millions of dollars in the Civil War in order to pay off this ridiculous amounts of debt that you have. Well, the problem with that is the United States government doesn't have enough money to pay off all their debts. So they do the dumbest possible thing that they can do. They just print off a whole bunch more money. It's hopefully talked about this in economics. This is like the worst possible thing that you can do. You cannot print money and think you're making more money. Money has to represent something. It was based on gold. They just said, no, nah, we're not gonna base on anything. Print off as much as you want. It's called greenbacks. That was the name of the money uh, during the Civil War. It was called greenbacks. It was completely worthless. It was awful. It was uh, horrific, right? Greenbacks uh, uh, were awful because they basically became worthless. It caused massive inflation. So even though the greenbacks became worthless, who did massive inflation benefit? The poor people. Because when you have all this useless money, it's real easy to pay off your debts when you were loaned money when that money was actually worth something. You can pay it off real easy. It's like you're paying it off with Monopoly money. Hooray. All right. Well, the bankers and, and, and those guys, those are the rich guys. They don't like this. All right. Inflation makes all their existing money worth less. So after the Civil War, we're here in the late 1800s. It is obvious that we have to fix the money in America. All right. So the rich people who control Congress, all right, and, and uh, really control the laws, they're like, all right, let's just go base the money back on gold again. If you take money that was based on nothing, hopes and dreams, and you base it on gold, is it going to be more valuable? Absolutely. What's that called? Deflation. Because the value of the dollar went up because it takes less dollars uh to, to buy something, so that's why it's deflation, but the value of the dollar goes up. It's called deflation. That benefits the rich. Who is it awful for? It's awful for the poor people. So the rich people want to change it back, what's called the gold standard. Base money on gold. When this gets brought up, all the farmers in the middle of the country are furious and they're horrified. Yes, they were given all this land of the Homestead Act because they had zero dollars to their name, but how did they build their houses and their barns and, and, and buy their seed? Is debt. They had to borrow the money and they're paying it off each year. If you base money on gold, there is no way they will be able to pay off their debts. Now, the farmers aren't crazy. They realize that you got to do something. They don't want money based on gold. The farmers want it based on silver. So rich people want money based on gold, so it can be worth more. The poor people and, and, and the people in the middle of the country want money based on silver. They had to create their own political party called the Populist Party, made up mainly of farmers in the middle of the country. And there's a ton of them who are going to say, you cannot base money on gold. If you base money on gold, you're absolutely going to destroy us and there's nothing that we can do. Uh, so they want it based on silver because silver is still a, a, you know, a precious metal, but it's more abundant than gold. That's why it's not as expensive. So they want it based on silver. They actually advanced their thinking into something called bimetallism. They're like, well, here's what we'll even do. We can even base it on like a little bit of silver and a little bit of gold. This way we can, by adding how much you want to base it on, you can actually control the value of the money moving forward. So all the farmers in the middle of the country are like, yes, we need to base it on bimetallism. Absolutely. And they created a political party. The political party is so strong that the Democrats actually had to join the populist party because the Populist Party had gotten more popular than the Democrats. Now, in the North, it's still the Republicans. And these are the big robber baron guys, and they're like, we can just ignore what all these poor people want. We don't care about them. So 
the Populist Party basically gets ignored in 1896 uh, when they're running for president. So not only is the Populist Party the farmers who want money based on bimetallism or silver, anything but gold. Going on the gold standard is, is awful. Here's who they run for president uh, is William Jennings Bryan. All right. So William Jennings Bryan, Bryan is the most famous preacher of the time. So William Jennings Bryan, he runs for president uh, in 1896, uh, and he's going to lose, but this is what's going to be really important here. He runs for president because uh, he's nominated by the populist and democratic parties. So, so, so they, they combine and they run him. This is him uh, holding a cross. He is a preacher, very famous. He toured the country promoting bimetallism. Basically, do not go to the gold standard. This is, and, and he has a very famous speech. All right, and they a lot of times like to ask you this on the test, uh, like I will. It is his, called his cross of gold speech. The cross of gold speech says that farmers are being crucified by the gold standard. That if America goes to the gold standard, it is equivalent of like executing the farmers. Because that's what the cruci crucifix is, is execution of Jesus. He's a uh, religious symbolism, all right? So his cross of gold speech says, if you go to the gold standard, you're going to wipe out your farmers. They're not going to be able to grow food anymore. And you're going to kill the entire country because everybody's going to starve to death if you cater to the rich people. The Republicans are like, we're going to the gold standard. Who cares? Uh, so... In the election of 1896, it is William McKinley, all right? And we'll talk more about him as, as this unit goes on. William McKinley, he's basically the lapdog of the robber barons. They chose him. They're like, yes, you go be president. And he's going to run against, oh, ho-hum, William Jennings Bryan. Whoever the robber barons pick always wins in a landslide. Well, McKinley does win, but all the blue states, they all voted for the other guy. They all voted for William Jennings Bryan, all right? So this is the election of, of 1896. This is how third party and, and, and non-major parties are very influential. When, even though McKinley won, he realized, and yet it's 271 to 176, it doesn't seem that close, but it really was. I mean, this is, this is crazy. Like, that this many people would vote against you. It's usually just this, but it is obvious that this whole idea of the gold standard is an extremely divisive concept. So yes, when McKinley comes in, I think they technically say they're going to go to the gold standard because there is a law that says they're going to do it. But they realize that there is so much anger against the gold standard that they can't truly commit back to the gold standard. And McKinley actually doesn't. Even though he says he's going to do it, they actually cater very much to the populist party, the farmers in the middle of the country. So much so that four years later in the election, when William McKinley runs for re-election uh, and uh, uh, William Jennings Bryan runs against him again, this is uh, so this is the map right now. This is the next year. All these states right here changed their votes and voted for McKinley again. Because McKinley understood you can't ignore this massive amount of the country. Uh, so the Populist Party is very famous for standing up against going back to the gold standard because it would only benefit the rich people and would be absolutely astronomically negative to the poor people and the people that are in debt. This is a, a photograph of William Jennings Bryan uh, a, a few years later. Uh, all right. Uh, so that's as far as we're going to get today. I'll take off my thinking cap. Oh, oh. what just happened? Where am I? Oh, did I put the thinking cap on again? Oh, 